we're safe. Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. As I write this in July of 2023, we have been flooded with months and months of Barbie movie content, including promotion for the big soundtrack. But for months, the question was, would one particular song be featured on the soundtrack? Studios denied it for a long time, but they were completely lying. And sure enough, eventually the announcement came. The soundtrack will feature a remix of Aqua's Barbie Girl. I know what I must do. I'm a Barbie girl in the Barbie world. Full disclosure, I've held off on doing this episode for years because I was waiting for this movie to come out. And I hadn't really thought about it, but actually Barbie Girl is pretty instrumental to the course of my life. Uh, when I was just a little kid, I became fixated on the entire concept of bad songs. The first step towards haterdom, which I would eventually turn into a full-time career. I'd ask friends and adults what the worst song ever was, and I got a lot of answers like, Mambo number five, Who Let the Dogs Out, and of course, one particular Euro pop song still lingering in people's brains. Thinking about my stupid little survey now, I'd say that what we think of as the canonical bad songs are actually the annoying songs. Artificial sounding, super catchy, super irritating. You can brush my hair. Like this. At the time, Barbie Girl was the single worst song most people could imagine. Even as recently as 2011, Rolling Stone readers voted it the worst song of the 90s. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, it's much easier to argue that Barbie Girl is actually a good song, probably even a great song. But it is 100% an annoying song. I'm a it did seem at first like the stupidest song ever written. A truly shameless rhyme of girl with world, sugar pop vocals that wouldn't leave your head. You can play. Barbie Girl had its fans, but it wasn't necessarily a song you listened to because you liked it. It was more like you didn't have a choice. Even if you only heard it once, it was constantly playing in your head. Because it was such an outwardly stupid song, it's easy to miss how willfully offensive it was. A really smutty take on a toy for little girls. You can brush my hair, me None of this was an accident. It was brilliant, really. But the American public just didn't know what to do with these screaming neon Scandinavians, and eventually we tossed them aside like so many outgrown dolls before them. What was their deal exactly before they ruined all of our childhoods? Well, hey Bobby, wanna go for a ride? I think it's time to get in our pink Corvette, drive to our dream house, and untangle this song. This stupid, annoying song that, Jesus Christ, might be one of the most influential tracks of the 90s. Here we go. Come on, Bobby, let's go party. Come on, Bobby, let's go party. Come on, Bobby, let's go party. <laughs> okay, we're gonna stop that. Let's do this. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. This story ends with a movie for children. And it starts with one, too. I'd say pack the This is a Danish children's movie called Freke Frida. I shouldn't be attempting Danish pronunciation. Naughty Frida and the Fearless Spies. Doesn't look like anything you need to watch. The important thing for our purposes is that it brings us the first known appearance of Soren Rosted and Klaus Noreen, two childhood friends from Denmark who wanted to make music together. Their first real gig was the soundtrack to this movie. Yeah, not, not really music that makes me expect bigger and better things. But for one of these songs, they needed a rapper. And luckily, there was a club DJ named René Dief working on something in the same studio, and he was like, uh, I can rap, let me. And after that soundtrack, they were like, that was great, we should record more stuff together, but we need a singer. And the girl Renee was dating, Lena Nystrom, she kind of elbowed her way in there, like, I can sing. See, so listen to me sing. And the two guys really liked how the two of them sounded together, so they were like, yeah, well, yeah, let's do this. And thus they started the band that would bring them all to fame, 
Joy Speed. And they released their first song, Itsy Beatsy Spider. Okay, there's a good Aqua retrospective in Rolling Stone, and there is a passing mention of Itsy Bitsy Spider, and all it says is that the band agrees it wasn't very good. No, no, I'm sorry, you don't get to glance off of it like that. If I interviewed this band, I would ask about nothing but the creative process behind Itsy Bitsy Spider. That demands an answer. But anyway, this does help me understand the direction of their career. They started with children's music, and then they began their Europop career by ruining a kid's song so badly that they immediately had to change their name. I assume that's why they changed their name. But they were onto something. Taking things meant for children, giving it an aggressive Europop sheen. Maybe we can do something with that. If we can only find the right target. Most of what the new Teen Talk Barbie says is pretty harmless, considering the source, but some of the dolls are programmed to say, and I quote, math class is tough. That has drawn fire from those who think Barbie's remark reinforces a stereotype about girls. I remember this. I shouldn't remember this, because, you know, what did I care? I was obviously not into girls' dolls. Or boys' dolls, honestly. Didn't really get them. Like, okay, I just, uh, bought this at Target. Um... What do, you, what do you do with it? Do you, I wasn't a very imaginative kid. But even though I didn't play with Barbies, I do remember lots of controversies about Barbies. Like, over and over again. Like this thing about her being an airhead who says things like, Myth is hard. It seems kind of much. Like, I didn't like math class either. I don't think Barbie has to. But, of course, the controversy isn't about a single, maybe, iffy thing she said one time. Barbie was everything we didn't want to be, and we're being told to be. Barbies have always been controversial. Ever since feminist cultural criticism existed, Barbie was one of its first targets. Her stick-thin body and giant boobs, the emphasis on quote-unquote shallow luxuries like cars and dream houses and fashion and shopping. By the 90s, I distinctly remember tons of these little flare-ups and discourses over this line of dolls. It feels very modern in hindsight. Barbie was one of the first things we were probably thinking too hard about, at least that I can remember. That class is tough. Now, I'm not weighing in on any of that controversy myself. I'm gonna leave that to people who actually know about Barbies and or the various strains of feminism at play. Certainly, many girls will tell you that Barbie has always been a positive role model. Authority should derive from the consent of the governed, not from the threat of force. And Mattel has tried to make her that way, sure. Over the decades, they've been like, like she's a doctor now, and we can give her a smaller cup size. Whatever it takes to turn the backlash down. Although Jax is probably going to write a decades late song about how Barbie ruined her childhood anyway. The point is, despite all that, the negative stereotype did still exist whether they wanted it to or not. This is where Aqua comes in. Okay, at this point, Aqua had managed to get a couple hits in Denmark that I don't really think are worth discussing. But when they wrote Barbie Girl, they knew they had something big. And they didn't come completely out of nowhere either. We had been exposed to many years of Scandinavian Europop by 1997. And we also had a good solid year of Spice priming the pump for this. So there was a build up. But you know, I can say that nothing really ever prepares you for Barbie Girl. Hiya, Bobby. Hi, Ken. You wanna go for a ride? Sure, Ken. Jump in. I'm a Barbie girl in the Barbie world. Still as terrifying as the first day I heard it. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. I'm a Barbie girl in the Barbie world. Life is plastic. It's fantastic. There really was nothing like Barbie Girl. Barbie Girl captured you instantly. Something about that melody, the combination of Renee's ugly rasp and Lena's squeaky ear cutting vocals. Make me walk. Lena's the perfect Barbie, or at least the negative stereotype version of her. 
that perfectly over the top, cloyingly girly, almost chipmunk voice. Even if she does not really look the part, she was the perfect Barbie. On the other hand, I'm still not quite sure what to do with their odd interpretation of creepy, predatory Euro trash Ken. Kiss me here, touch me there, hanky panky. Like, Ken has always been a bland, vaguely gay, nothing of a man. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. Bald, growling, head tattoo Renee is not any Ken doll I ever saw. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. <laughs> it's an odd combo, but it works. If by works you mean gets endlessly stuck in your head. Now there will always be people complaining about vapid pop music, but Barbie Girl was like designed to piss them off personally. It felt like having pure sugar injected into your bloodstream while your brain was sucked out of your ears. You could feel yourself becoming dumber listening to it. And that sounds like I'm insulting it, but I'm not. This is all by design. I would argue that it's a very smart song, certainly a very layered and complicated song. But it is also a very stupid, shallow song, in the sense that it is literally about being very shallow and stupid. I'm a it's a perfect match of form and function. We were already calling this kind of music superficial and plastic. Here's a song literally about being superficial and plastic. Even if you don't like the song, I feel like you have to still admire the craft. Like those Scandinavians, man, they got music, melody, down to like a precise math. Even just playing it now, I was kind of struck by how if you take out the aesthetic and the lyrics, it sounds almost classical. But of course, the aesthetic is pretty important. I know this is not the first ode to shallowness that's ever existed. There's Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, still ice fucking cold by the way, and that directly inspired Madonna's Material Girl, which probably inspired Barbie Girl. Material World, Material Girl, Barbie Girl in a Barbie World, but Marilyn and Madonna made gold digging seem a lot more empowering. Barbie Girl doesn't even try. You can touch, you can play. It is very explicitly about having no thoughts and existing for the pleasure of men. Barbie Girl isn't a gold digger because she doesn't have that level of self-interest. Like, like I say it's about shallowness, but that doesn't really cover it, does it? The song's filthy. This Barbie Girl is explicitly a sexually submissive plaything. I was a little kid and I was like, I don't know if I should be listening to this. Like yes, there are obviously filthier songs out there, but like this isn't just the implication. They do say it out loud. You can brush my hair, me everywhere. The thing is, even without the feminist criticisms of Barbie dolls, there is still something really dirty about these things. The first thing any small child does with a Barbie is rip off her clothes. It's a thing. Pretty much every little boy in America with a sister remembers taking one of her Barbies and pulling up her skirt to see what she had under there. What? It's not rapey. She's not real. It's a doll. You can do whatever you want with it. It's an inanimate object. Barbie dolls are literally the objectification of women. So even if you make Barbie a scientist or a president or whatever, that's always still literally gonna be true. You make a hot doll, that's always gonna be the subtext. That's why, according to Aqua, Barbie has nothing in her head but polystyrene. She looks gorgeous, she has expensive things, and you can do whatever you want to her. It was provocative in a way that I don't think critics or most anyone was prepared to deal with. You know, shallow on purpose, unironic bimbo anthem. Actually, is it ironic? I think we want to express happiness and uh, humor and irony. I think there's a case for it. Certainly they have to know they're pushing buttons. But if Aqua's being ironic, they don't break character ever. We're not trying to change the world with our lyrics. We just want to have some fun. And Life in plastic really does sound fantastic. Like Barbie's whole thing is, you can be anything. And I was like, yeah, you can be anything. You can be a submissive airhead. It's great. They made a kid's song that sounds like kinky roleplay shit. And the more I think about it, the more impressed I am how inappropriate it is. The kind of listeners who loved this song tended to be the same little girls who liked the Spice Girls, who themselves were being questioned about the message they were sending. Was this song controversial? Oh yes. 
people were upset about it, especially Mattel. Boy, oh boy, was Mattel not happy. They hated Barbie Girl. There was a lawsuit about it that dragged on for fucking ever. Aqua won that lawsuit, and I guess Mattel has made their peace with the song since. But even still, you can understand why they weren't thrilled about it. Probably still aren't. Out of a billion Barbie products and tie-ins and media, this is still the first thing people associate with their product. It's not what Mattel would have written. But beyond that, people didn't like the song because it was just irritating. It, yes, obviously someone liked it because it was a humongous hit, but it really felt like more people hated it than liked it. The NME called it music for serial killers. The thing is though that music for serial killers is a compliment as far as I'm concerned, and there's a reason we kept it around. I've never thought about it, but it feels like Barbie Girl has left a dreamhouse sized shadow over pop music. For one thing, we have the whole Barbie core aesthetic now, which obviously you credit that to Barbie herself first, but it feels like this song was the first time that aesthetic was truly defined. And every intentionally plastic pop star that's come after, Nikki, Kim Petras, you can see Barbie Girl all over them. And you can see their Sugar Rush aesthetic in the more poppy, hyper-pop. Yeah, Barbie Girl, the first hyper-pop song? Probably not, but I wanted to say it anyway. Listening to this song now, this doesn't even strike me as anything out of the ordinary anymore. I'm sure the kids born after the 90s think I'm just being over the top. It's just another bop to them. That's the influence. I think we have no choice but to call Barbie Girl a work of genius. And it was not even that big in this country. It felt huge, but it only reached number seven, probably because too many people hated it. But it was number one everywhere else. Aqua was well on the path to superstardom. Oh, I'm having so much fun! Well, Bobby, we're just getting started. Or are we? Now, the way I remember it, everyone in America decided that Aqua could never be allowed to have a hit again. Get out of our country, you plastic Lego people. Go home. But naturally, Aqua was able to have a pretty successful career full of hits. In Europe, a diseased and rotting place which has long outlived its usefulness. And not just in their home country either, or just on the continent. In the UK, they actually had two more number one hits. Now, I had discovered the internet by the late 90s, so I was cruising a lot of British music sites. That's probably why I recognized the title. Dr. Jones. Hmm. Obviously, there's only one Dr. Jones I know of. Dr. Jones. Again, we see there is nothing you can possess which I cannot take away. But surely, that's not who this song is about. Surely. And let's just hold off for a comically long amount of time. Okay, let's hear it. All that anticipation over whether Barbie Girl would make the Barbie soundtrack, and yet no one wondered if Dr. Jones would make the soundtrack to Indiana Jones 5. I mean, didn't you want to see decrepit old Harrison Ford getting down to this? Honestly, despite the video, I don't think this is actually about Indiana Jones. There's not actually any reference that that's the Dr. Jones they're talking about. Doesn't sound to be about anything, actually. Wake up, Dr. Jones? Wake up, Dr. Jones! Wake up! Eh, okay, maybe. But this is definitely a lot less loaded than Barbie Girl and, uh, without those layers of irony to engage my critic -y, thinky thinky brain, I don't think I enjoy this kind of music. Yeah, I don't know why the Brits sent this to number one. It's kind of just Barbie Girl, but less interesting and worse. Khaki-colored Barbies does not work for me. Give me time to reset. Anyway, their other UK number one is called Turn Back Time. And it's, uh, I guess it's like a, a, a trip hop ballad, I guess. And it, it, it's kind of heartbreakingly beautiful. Yeah, I don't know, this is, uh, this is actually very pretty. It's a, it's a little off-brand. 
Yeah, they should do that big aqua scope intro at the beginning of this one too. Yeah, turn back time, I would absolutely go to bat for. I love basically everything they're doing here, even though they are completely unrecognizable. A lot of cool things happening. Weird break beat breakdown in the bridge. And all the other guys get to provide some backup vocals. Yeah, I actually like this a lot. So why did none of these songs hit it big in America? The answer? Because they didn't come out here. Their label in America decided that these proven hits in Europe wouldn't fly over here. So instead they went with Lollipop parentheses Candyman. Mm-hmm. Dun dun dun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't get it. Bounty land? For the record, no one in Aqua thinks this was a good choice of single. I guess the label figured it was the closest thing to Barbie Girl. You know, you make plastic bubblegum music, Barbie was plastic, here's the bubblegum. But yeah, I wouldn't have gone with this either. For one thing, the chorus prominently mentions a candy bar they don't even make in this country. In any case, this almost but did not crack the top 20, and no one seemed to care for it, and it disappeared. Aqua would never touch this continent again. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you a special news bulletin which has just come in. The major okay, their second album went big with their lead single, Cartoon Heroes. Now, I do remember hearing of Cartoon Heroes from the internet, but I never actually listened to it. Can I say, this song is just baffling. We are what we're supposed to be. Okay, here is Lena dressed like Lilu in the fifth element. You know, I expected a dance beat, but it's going nuts with the orchestra here in a way that really does not vibe with her vocals. We are the Carlos Symphony. We do the things you want. Boy, I think we've really overtaxed Renee's vocal abilities here. The premise of this song. I think by cartoon heroes they mean comic book heroes, which is what that is called. But they're not superheroes in the music video. I, I guess since Barbie Girl got some play out of artificiality, they're going for it again. Barbie was made of plastic. Cartoons are ink and paint. But unlike Barbie Girl, I can't tell what point they're trying to make from that. Arachnophobian? What are you even talking about? Yeah, I have no idea what's going on. And for the record, this entire album is like just off the rails. What what do you think Freaky Friday is? Aqua released a few more aesthetic atrocities off this album, two diminishing returns. What is this? It's rubbish! Exactly. We're a lot more than just a Barbie band. Right, because we want to look like the pop stars we really are. Exactly, you know, we're a lot more than just a Barbie band. Barbie band, Barbie band, Barbie band. Okay, that's kind of funny. And it is nice to know that even when these bands are not technically one-hit wonders abroad, they still basically are. After the second album kind of underwhelmed, they basically broke up. Or at the very least, they went on a very long hiatus. During that hiatus, Lena married one of the guys in the band, and not the guys she came in with. So I think there might have been some Fleetwood Mac type shenanigans going on. They reunited in 2009 for their Greatest Hits album and one more album in 2011. Here's one song I really liked, I have for a long time, called Back to the 80s. I know it's weird to be listening to a 90s band reminisce about the 80s and 
God knows, we were already too full of 80s nostalgia at that point. But yeah, I don't know. This song is the jam. I've loved it for a really long time. And since then, they've reunited and gone on tour off and on. The marriage didn't last, but the band has. And of course, they returned to the top 10 this year, since they're credited on the Barbie World remix. Which raises the question, are they still one-hit wonders? The answer is yes, yes they are. Mmm. Yeah. Ah, 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 yeah. I'm not gonna stand up for their entire maddening discography, but there is definitely more gems there than just Barbie Girl. But even if Barbie Girl was their only song a note, they deserve better for that alone. Barbie Girl is not the worst song ever. Or hell, maybe it is the worst song ever, but it's also a great song. It's a very smart, very stupid, very complicated, very, very important song. I don't remember ever agreeing with everyone who told me it was a bad song, and I also still don't know if I actually like the song, honestly, but I do respect it. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. Barbie Girl was the plastic pop song to end all plastic pop songs, and damaged some multi-million dollar brands in the process. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. Oh wow, her robe comes right off. Jeez. Oh, I love you, Ken.